I'm William Wright, a member of the Municipal Arts Society's Board of Directors. MAS has always believed that technology can assist in advancing diversity and sustainability in urban planning. Early on, MAS recognized the strengths of GIS map development and created the Community Information Technology Initiative in collaboration with the city. MyCity.org continues to provide New Yorkers the tools to create detailed maps of their neighborhoods, as well as easy access to data on land use, zoning, transportation, schools, and after-school programs. Additionally, two years ago, an atlas of community-based plans in New York City was published in 2008 by MAS and the Campaign for Community-Based Planning constituting the first online compendium of community-based plans in our city. Now we are pleased to call to your attention another advancement in technology that will prove to be a game changer in the urban planning sector, and that is called Betaville. To start off, I would like to introduce Norman Jackness, who worked with Carl Skelton during the early stages of the development of Betaville. Norman is the director of Cisco IBSG Public Sector. This is the enterprising firm that has underwritten the development of Betaville. Please welcome Norman Jackness. Uh, thank you very much. Um, just by way of background, the group I'm part of at Cisco is the company's think tank and pro, pro bono strategic advisory group. Um, and uh, uh, so uh, this has been very interesting. Um, I, my own background, by the way, is also um, in local government um, prior to joining Cisco and uh, also in the library world, which is an important part of our urban fabric. I'm currently president of the Metropolitan New York Library Council, for example. In any case, I thought it was interesting uh, listening early, earlier on um, about uh, how technology is playing a role in some of these things. And, and if you think about Jane Jacobs' vision, um, uh, in, in many ways we have some tools today um, that really takes us to the next, next generation of, of, of the kind of outlook that she was trying to encourage, um, where the network where technology is now um, a means of empowering the edge of empowering citizens uh, to play a role. You'll be seeing more examples of this. Um, Cisco itself um, has been uh, actively involved in a lot of these things. Urban uh, efforts have been a key part of the company's global strategy. My own group, the Think Tank, uh, has worked with the Clinton Global Initiative on something we call connected urban development in a number of cities around the world. Um, I was um, brought into the U.S. Conference of Mayors uh, a few months ago to uh, help them develop uh, what they uh, lovingly called a strategy for the economic viability of American cities in 2030. Little project. Um, we've, uh, and that's led to a variety of things, including some things uh, that really deal with the physical space and place uh, of, of urban centers in America, um, and even in terms of how you can take advantage of this blending of physical and virtual that we've heard about in some of the previous panels, how you can take advantage of that uh, to provide uh, whole new destination places and cities. Um, I've also done work on next generation government projects that are empower citizens um, not only to play a participatory role in the decision making, but actually even the delivery of public services at the local level. So in all of these, the focus has been on, on, on socioeconomic trends and how technology and the ubiquitous communications network will impact urban areas. That's the first thing. We're not telling people they need a certain technology. We're telling them the world is changing already. You're going to be impacted by it. And of course, on the other side of that, how urban leaders uh, can use some of the newer technologies to improve urban life. And that's why Betaville is of interest to us. Um, and that's why I've worked with Carl. Uh, what attracts us about Betaville is it's not only a tool for urban design, uh, but also for citizen engagement and participation in this century with this century's tools. Uh, before, I, uh, before Carl presents Betaville, I want to give you a background, a, a bit about him, because I actually think he's a very creative and visionary person, and give, give you a sense of sort of his diverse background. He's originally from Toronto. Um, his professional background is in fine arts, uh, multimedia, with a particular uh, interest in work for public spaces. Uh, he earned a Bachelor of Fine Arts 
uh, from Queen's University. He earned a Master's of Visual Arts. He's on his way to getting a doctorate in engineering and informatics from the Technical University of Bremen, Germany. I kind of like to think that combination of skills is a very 21st century one. Um, in Toronto, he served for a few years as the president of the Niagara Neighborhood Association, which was, a, uh, in his words, a classic Jacobs-style success story. A rich mix of traditional uh, downtown industry, artists, immigrants, activists, and some good political leadership. And he learned what can go right when a community is ready to seize the moment. And he also learned what can go wrong and how wasteful sometimes efforts can be. So at the end of his formal studies in the fall of 1998, he took a brief trip to this city to, as he put it, clear his head in one of Jane Jacobs' other hometowns. Um, and he has been here ever since. Um, bringing you this up to date without going into everything, Carl is the founding director of the Brooklyn Experimental Media Center and the integrated digital media programs of NYU's Polytechnic Institute. And he will soon open up the Game Innovations Lab sponsored by New York State government. Carl's current initiatives include partnerships with people and organizations as diverse as this one, the city of Bremen, the music technology program at NYU, uh, particularly uh, in their Motive Association project, and Microsoft Research's Games for Learning Institute. And now to bring the story up to date with the Betaville project, here's Carl. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, I have been busy for the last few years, it's true, but I'm going to ask you to collaborate with me in a bit of imaginative visualization. Imagine that I am the cold glass of Sauvignon Blanc that you really wish that I were uh, at this time of day. Uh, and uh, I will uh, do my best uh, to uh, help you get there. Now, let me just find uh, what the heck the materials are here. I am looking for this right here. We had to close the laptop. And so, Shazam, Shazam. The, um, there's nothing more terrifying than the AV when you're a digital media person because people form <laughs> expectations that things will work for you that don't work for anyone else. Um, well, we'll see. Um, so, yes, it is true uh, that um, my work has, you know, included uh, community activism in redeveloping areas, which has included art in the public realm, which has included digital media. Uh, I have to admit, though, uh, that it was some time into my time in New York that I realized that all the different things I was doing actually had some kind of coherence to them. Uh, and that indeed uh, it was adding up to something in particular. Uh, and that there had been a life's work in progress all that time. And I can't tell you what a relief that was uh, to find out. And what a joy it has been for me to find out um, hold on a second, the, uh, that there are an awful lot of people here, uh, indeed, um, that I have more friends uh, and collaborators and, um, than, I, than I ever knew, and indeed also that the Municipal Art Society is great and as established and as strong as its tradition is. I'm here to tell you that the Municipal Art Society has more friends and admirers and supporters and lovers than it even knows, and that there is going to be some fun to be had besides that glass of Sauvignon Blanc. So the, um, the Brooklyn Experimental Media Center is getting up and running. Uh, what I'm going to talk to you more specifically about this evening is a little twist on this idea of the Municipal Art Society, um, which is the art of municipal society. Uh, this is indeed the craft I had been training for all this time. Now, what I mean by that, and I'll give you not so many bullet points through these uh, uh, 37 minutes and 14 seconds we have to go, uh, which is broad, deep, and effective participation, uh, which 
in order to be those three things has to be ongoing. It has to be something that is happening all the time. It has to already, already, always have been going on when the critical moments arrive, when the proposals are to be prepared for the deadlines, when the processes are to be undertaken. Uh, the groundwork has to be there, which means, of course, that it has to work the way open source software works because the way society works, which is to say 24-7, people have to be able to contribute when they have time, when they have ideas, over the months and years and decades between these moments of crisis. Um, it also, and this most particularly, and this was the thing, this is the thing now that I'm just starting to know my way around New York after over a decade here. Uh, it has to, what participatory means, uh, and to be clear about this, there are two participatories that I know. One is the history of software development uh, within this framework, an approach to it, and the other is participatory design and planning, the way we're used to thinking of it in this context. Um, Within both of those, what participatory fundamentally means as a technical term is an environment in which professional expertise of a general kind, the disciplines, can collaborate fruitfully, effectively, intimately, um, collaboratively, uh, with local knowledge. It's that synthesis that has to happen for any of these things to have a fighting chance. Without that local knowledge, the general expertise is nothing. Without that expertise, that local knowledge has no power to become and move. Um, now, the good news about that is, in fact, uh, the, these two histories uh, have a lot to offer each other. Uh, and in particular, one of the things that always made me laugh when moving between the worlds is open source software. You know, there's Linus Torvalds is in his parents' basement in Helsinki in 1991. He puts something online. A bunch of people tell him he's dead wrong or that he forgot something or he should have done this. And he thanks everybody politely and the things that he can use he puts in there and it grows and it grows and arrives at a mature consensus, something that works, and whose fundamental security system is that the same person who was going to hack it and bring it down when it was private property is alerting people to the security hole and fixing it themselves in the middle of the night. And in fact, the cranks and curmudgeons and geeks and people who won't stop talking about something that nobody else has been thinking that hard, they have no idea what's going on, those are the same people everybody takes for granted as the builders and creators of mature, robust, reliable, flexible systems in the public interest. Those are the same people we think can't, or somebody thinks, can't do that same work for cities. And they can. Um, and indeed, we're working on that right now. That's the Betaville project. A massively multiplayer, open source, Mirror World Editor for Web and Mobile for Public Art, Urban Design, and Planning Applications. Now, this is four separate mouthfuls, and you're at the lowest point in your blood sugar level curve of the day. I want you to recognize or understand that I recognize that, and I will do my best to get you home. Um, massively multiplayer. Everybody knows what a massively multiplayer game is. Maybe they don't. A massively multiplayer game is essentially an online game in which large numbers of people can play in the same virtual environment at will. And we know that they do. Open source, open source software is at the other, on the other side from private commercial proprietary software of participatory. This is entirely volunteer built and freely shared. A mirror world editor is my own trope. In 1992, uh, before the Unabomber got to him, he's recovered somewhat since, David Galernter actually not only defined, proposed, but indeed predicted with absolute certainty that shortly there would be such a thing as a mirror world. A model of the place where you live, the city you live in, in which you would navigate and go to places where the documents would be, the congressional record, the transcripts, the planning proposals. And in that environment, you would debate the issues of the day with your neighbors and peers by going to the places together at the same time, and indeed to go to the extreme step of even voting within this environment. Now, 
When we get to the pictures, it'll be more obvious. When I say mirror world editor, that means that not only can you go to that place, but you can get the benefit of the absolute and infinite malleability and plasticity of that world. Because the dirty secret of cities is that they are always physically in a state of mutation. They are always changing. And the question cannot be how can we make the whole city stay the way it is. There are things we must keep within it. There are rates of change we must insist on. Uh, but the fact that we can go in there and put up, the same way Linus Torvalds put up the kernel uh, for uh, Linux, uh, you know, while in a certain sense goofing off, it was recreational, creative, play, public service, I don't know. Um, you could put up an idea for a new work of art in the public space. You could put up for changing the shape of a street, for adding buildings, for making them different, for taking things out, for moving things around, for rethinking how green public spaces in downtown Brooklyn might re be reconnected to each other conceptually, having happened by a patchwork of happenstance, or as they now are. All of those, and people could get online and tell you you're totally dead wrong and that it should be here or you forgot something and they'll fix it for you or they won't or somebody else will take it upon themselves to fix it for you. And over time, when people have time, uh, over those days and months and years and decades, that same process can get you mature design by consensus from the community and indeed from those members of the community professionally or otherwise mandated to move the ball into the concrete sphere. Now, those are the physical elements that we're thinking about right now. There may yet be others. Um, connecting the dots. I went to art school. What am I doing here? Um, what did, and these things all have as much in common as it turns out. I mean, Cisco, Cisco? Uh, and an architecture technology program, the Rockefeller Foundation. I mean, if, you know, if I went back to Toronto and explained to people what I'm doing and that this all actually adds up to something in particular that makes any kind of sense, it would be more than a glass. We'd be a couple of bottles in. Um, now, here, uh, indeed, the first um, paradox, the first squared circle, proposing an art and technology program uh, and within a concept of art as public, uh, to an engineering school was already nuts. And when I proposed it, I thought, okay, this is gonna take a lot of explaining. And my department head didn't let me finish. He took me to the provost, Army Corps of Engineers, retired Colonel Fletcher Bud Griffiths, rumored to wear an ankle gun to department head meetings, thick southern accent, Vietnam, terrifying dude. I gave two-thirds of the other half of the pitch, and if I may be forgiven a little bit of earthy language, not terribly, he wouldn't let me quite finish. He said, God damn it, son, I've been waiting 25 years for somebody to get up the nerve to promise to take responsibility for getting this done. When can you start? <laughs> so any prejudices you may have about the prejudices of engineers against such things, I have some people for you to meet. In any case, here, um, in the first cohort of the master's program, he ordered me to implement forthwith Master of Science in Integrated Digital Media. I had a student who was just back from taking second at the early music contest in Boston, was a system administrator for CUNY, and people were panicking that he wasn't going to be there because he was going back to school. Uh, and was also involved with the development of an experimental multimedia collective called SHARE, uh, which meets with hardware in bars in Williamsburg uh, on Sunday nights. Now, <clears throat> uh, they were spawning nodes of this collective, and one of their members had spawned a node in Bremen, and Eric thought we should talk, and we did talk, and next thing I knew, I was at an international urban media symposium, in the city of Bremen and at the M2C. Now, I thought I'd invented this concept, but indeed, the M2C was precisely in the business of mobile in particular, but 
basically software engineering for cultural and civic applications um, with a similar relationship to a similar kind of institution. And so it made pretty good sense for us to work together. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, there's an awful lot of background that is now starting to converge. What we have here uh, is um, a spread from a prospectus published by the Bankers Trust uh, in 1946, a rendering of the future of Lower Manhattan uh, in charcoal uh, by Hugh Ferris. Now, those of you who are architectural historians in the room will know that this is atypical for Hugh Ferris uh, and indeed anachronistic for Hugh Ferris who is much better known as the guy who defined the image and aesthetic and vision of Gotham. Now, with my background, I happened to recognize not only the value and benefit of European expressionism in the visual arts, uh, but the use of that in conjunction with a clear understanding of the physical potential of new building technologies after World War I, and the negotiation, the dance they were going to be doing with the building regulatory framework as it was then developing. Exactly the kind of synthesis you need if you want to have any fun with this stuff. Jump forward, woo! 1959, Paris, one of the situationists, abandoned painting programmatically saying that the only meaningful art form in the 21st century was integrated urbanism, fantasized a new Babylon in which the technologies would be so reliable and so robust uh, that indeed cities could simply aggregate as the artifacts of daily creative play on the part of citizens. Now, one of my jokes about this is architects love this because it sounds like anarchism, but everything basically matches. Um, it didn't quite get built as such per se. But meanwhile, at the other end of the spectrum, the digital media that would and could at least model this were developing in two very different trajectories. On the one hand, you have this here, Liberty City, when I say it's Rockstar's Liberty City, this is a model of a slightly altered lower Manhattan uh, by Rockstar Games, which is the setting for Grand Theft Auto 4. Now, we assume two things about entertainment applications of digital media. One is that they're way better at it than we are, and two, they're nasty. Well, meanwhile, Another piece of the conundrum from another angle, and these things will converge, I promise. Um, <clears throat> one of my favorite architects in the entire universe, David Turnbull of Atopia, and I have a lot of favorite architects because there are a lot of terrific ones here and elsewhere. Um, for him, this is a visualization. For 95% of the people he's got to explain this to, it means nothing. People with PhDs in applied mathematics from MIT and Harvard will look at this and not be able to tell whether their office is being torn out. <clears throat> this, on the other hand, is a big piece of the state of the art of values-driven design in the service of inclusiveness of planning process at a regional uh, econometric level as a way of persuading local stakeholders of the importance of that level in order to get them to willingly sacrifice the bits that they recognize. Is this really a simulation or at what level? Here, and my apologies to Michael Van Valkenburg Associates uh, for uh, borrowing this, um, we have something uh, a little bit different. Now there's a blending of 3D visualization and schematic mappings. I can't tell you for sure how many of the people who looked at this thought that he was promising to paint a super graphic on a parking lot in the river. Um, now, 
Knowing what I know about the tools that such persons use to actually design, the question of the deliverability of that language um, arises. Now, I was asked to participate in a limited call for a public art commission, a very interesting project involving a collaboration between the city of Toronto, a landscaping firm that was in the business of putting corporate logos in marble chips and begonias on highway embankments in metropolitan Toronto, and a very interesting architect art consultant, originally from Toronto, who I'd met, whom I'd met in New York. And um, <clears throat> it was for a public art project that was a drive-by, which is to say ag against the side of the BQE. And I wrote what I thought was an exquisitely eloquent, crisp, precise, and intelligible proposal and gave plans and elevations. <clears throat> and I got a call. Uh, the commission was considering this proposal. And he said this. And then the other thing he said to me was that if you can get me a three-dimensional model in an animation or a fly-through or something in 48 hours, you probably have this gig. Um, now, it was a very simple thing. And uh, lenticular, two-foot square panels of stainless steel, uh, a drive-by, as I say. And all it would do, day in and day out, and this is an east-west commute, faced south. I knew that the light hitting it would change things. I knew that the di direction of travel would change things. I knew that people who saw this piece once were going to see it twice a day under those different conditions, traveling at different speeds according to the traffic loads. And it had to belong there. Uh, yes, uh, I did actually get that gig. It is 70 feet long, anchored in 80 cubic yards of concrete, will un uh, withstand wind loads of 140 miles an hour, and it really exists. Had there not been such a visualization, it would not. This was my first clue. Meanwhile, <clears throat> In 1989, Will Wright was programming and designing a military strategy game for Maxis and found that he enjoyed designing the environment more than he enjoyed designing the game. Um, this became SimCity. Now, if you've got a, a, you know, an econometric awareness of SimCity, you know that somewhere between 8 and 18 million people have spent hundreds and thousands of hours pretending to manage, this is a resource management game, a city with a Chrysler building in it. Uh, they have not just volunteered, they have paid for the privilege. If you add up those person hours to a reasonable estimate of dividing by a reasonable average of a human lifetime, OK, that capacity is out there to spend all day, all night, permanently. Uh, this one, in particular, in the corner you might notice, is actually the French version. There are quite a few languages. Now, here, creative social media becomes a slightly different question. Um, Back to the assumption about the rock star games folks being better at it than the good guys. Out of spite, to prove a point that the Java programming language, another, another thing on which, for which David Galernter was a forerunner, um, could produce a massively multiplayer online game that would perform technically as well as the C++ commercial ones, built a development environment called JMonkey. Almost all of the time that has gone into this piece of software has been volunteer since 2003. That developer community has done as good a job as almost all of the people who were getting paid, no matter how much that was. It is a community. Uh, and it is also available as the infrastructure for all kinds of things. Now, from a very different angle, in 2009, this is what downtown Brooklyn looked like to Google Earth. Now, the way Google Earth works is 
This is, was at this point just beginning to be the commercial location-based advertising vehicle which it is destined to fully become. Uh, the satellite photos are under license. These gray massing models are actually under license from Sanborn, which has been in the business of, of selling technical statistics for the insurance business since the 19th century. They've gone digital in that way. But you know, of course, that in Google Earth, if you've been there, there are a lot of buildings that actually have pictures of the actual buildings wrapped around them. They've been wallpapered. Um, what most of those in a lot of locations are actually done by volunteers. They give you a free 3D modeling app that they acquired some time ago, SketchUp. You download the model, you take the pictures, you stick them on, you put it back up. Entirely volunteer, and then all of those models are available for free as open source modelware through the Google 3D warehouse. Now, as of 2009, you might have thought that the New York City College of Technology, which has an architectural technology program that compels all of its students to produce a detailed 3D model of a building in the neighborhood, might have gotten around to, you know, doing up its Google Earth. No. Or the Polytechnic Institute of New York University's uh, integrated digital media programs uh, might have gotten around to doing poly. Uh, or perhaps the client representation firm or the architecture firm that are now working it up might have got around to it. No. What's been got around to? Two things. One, down here, Beryl Drew did the Brooklyn Historical Society's building. And a guy named Luke did the Farragut houses. Ergo, the distribution of competence and will and access to do these straightforward contributions is not distributed the way you might think. Now, just to make sure, a month and a half ago, as you can see, the advertising medium is coming along quite nicely. Uh, the post office, another Beryl Drew project, I think. Uh, courthouse, the Marriott, um, still no city tech, still no poly. Um, historical society's off the corner here. But the Brooklyn Tabernacle got done. I don't know. Looks like a different distribution of competencies than you might have thought. Now, recently, uh, we've been asked to look at Cadman Plaza, which is a very interesting piece of urban question, a problem of possibility, a park that was designed before there was such a thing as commuter access passenger car roads, indeed, before there was such a thing as a BQE, now an island of green isolated by these commuter accesses, which could be a very dynamic uh, connection between downtown Brooklyn, which is becoming something nobody expected, and Dumbo and the waterfront and that green beltway that's been being put around it. Um, now, because we've been tinkering with these things and we happen to have stuff handy, uh, the beginnings of the massing model, can you guys see this? Because I can't particularly, okay. Anyway, so, we can get buildings, we can take the Google 3D warehouse ones for free, we've got the topography, we've got all kinds of things going on in here, and we can begin to consider not only this level, but the much more important level, what I call the Jane's Eye View. Um, as in any other computer game, you can walk this sidewalk, which is mapped to the real one, along this park under these underpasses, and indeed, we've got this thing set up with audio, so you can hear the ambient noise levels of specific places. Um, this, at this point, we have now a language of representation of physical space that is equally well understood by planners, architects, and the neighbors. Everybody actually gets this stuff. When you're in one of these, you probably actually understand it in exactly the contrary relationship than from plans, elevations, long disquisitions, or diagrams. Now, 
our partners in Bremen, have an analogous problem. The Remberti Ring here is a roundabout. Commuter access roadways find themselves in what had been the heart of a city. There was a church here, the Remberti Kirche. And the kinds of things that you get when the commuter access roadway stuff is being done by people who are not fussy about what the locals think, this beautiful street severed, etc. Now, uh, what this is going to do is there's a whole other constituency for this problem in Bremen. A whole other regulatory framework, a whole other tradition of urban development and design, different politics, different players. Looking at this is going to help us look at the question of Cadman Plaza. And looking at Cadman Plaza is going to help them look at the Remberti Ring. All of this can happen simultaneously. Incidentally, um, well, I'll come back to that in a minute. Now here, this is the Dibner building on the NYU Poly campus, built in 1988, Davis Brody Bond project. Uh, they grossly overestimated the institutional competence of the client, if I may say so. This was designed as a loft building, 29 foot centers, so that we could flexibly reconfigure it any old time, as if somehow you could get academics to move walls without destroying an institution. Um, it's got stubs coming out of it. It's made to carry eight more floors, if we ever get our act together to need them. And it now contains, um, besides the library, Department of Electrical Engin and Computer Engineering, the Department of Computer Science, uh, the Pfizer Auditorium, the Department of Management of Technology, the Center for Advanced Technology and Telecommunications, the Wireless Center for Advanced Technology, the Center for Innovation in Technology and Entertainment, uh, and the Game Innovation Lab is now being built in here, and it still does not offer any sign or value or benefit of that to the university, to this public space, to Metro Tech, to the emerging neighborhoods, developing neighborhoods, artificially induced neighborhoods in the immediate vicinity, let alone to this network implicit or happenstance of public space. It becomes possible to think about these things because we can see them without having to build them, without having to commit to them. Ad hoc, we can play with the idea that perhaps this auditorium could go down instead of back up, could open out and give us our Spanish steps, give us our plaza, our amphitheater, a big enough auditorium to hold convocation in the borough, and indeed a, a home better suited uh, to the expression of the things we do. The displaced ones from underneath can be housed in some of the most beautiful prospect in Brooklyn. If you've ever been there, that, the, the trees, it's sublime. Um, and of course, contemplate the possibility of an uneven spacing of the vertical mullions as a tribute to Yanis Zanakis, who, as a structural engineer for Le Corbusier, developed the first stochastic algorithms, which he then applied to computer music, and indeed thereby to the Share Collective and other experimental multimedia that goes on at 4 o'clock in the morning in Williamsburg. And some of them know it. Of course, we can control the lighting in a game engine that we have built ourselves out of stuff that is freely shared. And every time we figure out how to do that, so can everybody else. We can also use environments like this. Part of the design of that amphitheater, by the way, the Bridge Street Church, a certain measure of rehabilitation of the approach to that building was possible. We can not only imagine those things and not only design those things, we can show people how far we've gotten. And if they've got a better idea, we can put that in before the meeting in the morning. Now, here, what you would see, if it, maybe if we could bring those stage lights down, that might be helpful, um, is a traditional rendering, so to speak, a game engine rendering, the JPEGs wrapped around as in Google Earth, better quality. We can also. Uh, that's progress. Um, 
turns out that architects actually hate solid models that look like they're made out of foam core. Uh, and they get all crazy, and they can't think straight, some of them. And so we said, OK, you know what? We can make this translucent at the push of a button and give you the depth and richness and the perception of the space from the outside. We can scoop things out. We can make them provisional. That yellow rectangle, by the way, is the garage in the physical world, uh, where Jerry Holton parks the school's car. Uh, but in Betaville, that's the access to the wormhole to Bremen. Yes, we can, because of the way the thing is set up, make it possible for you to show sections and interior divisions and skins in the same model. Yes, we can give you volume as well as mass. Yes, we can deal with not just the access to the transportation, that's J Street, Borough Hall, A, C, and F, uh, but also open up the ground and show you within the limits of our willingness to risk arrest, uh, where the subway actually runs underneath. Now, who can play? One of the demonstrators uh, was actually a graduate of the New York City College of Technology uh, Architecture Technology Program. Um, and this here is his version of the Dibner Building with a little bit of information he has about the FAR from the upzoning of 2000, I think, five. Um, now, this does not necessarily need to be built to be a valuable part of the conversation about what might be. Uh, also, people can participate not just adding stuff to the game, so to speak, but extending the platform to give us traffic simulations uh, and so on. And every time they do that for us, they're doing it for everybody. Um, one of the, the primary technical responsibility of the, of the Bremen folks has been, up to this point, a smartphone application, uh, which is part of the suite, so to speak. You can take an Android smartphone to a place for which a proposal has been made, hold up your phone with the camera on, and it will show you the proposal in situ, at scale, in register, with the camera view. You can walk around it in the place with what you had to do to get there, you know, your access and so on, in that noise environment with those connectivities, and get in on the debate about whether or not that's the perfect solution on the spot. Now here is a little something uh, that uh, they made in Bremen to give you some idea of what it takes to produce a 3D visualization to scale in context of a proposal to change the urban fabric as the beginning of as much process as we actually need for the community to have fully engaged the question before the hammer hits or the bell goes, depending on how you feel about these processes. It's that straightforward. This processing power, these graphics capacities, have come to the community through a combination of work imperatives and play and education. But the things that you thought were only possible for the professionals have been technically available to all of us, or at least so many more of us than have traditionally been inside the fence, uh, that we don't necessarily have to be that fussy about how open the door is, to be way more open than it has been. Now, when I, you say low-hanging fruit, and I've got three minutes and 12 seconds, low-hanging fruit. Ah, let's pick something simple, right? Easy. Battery park. Piece of cake. Now, battery park is an interesting case in a million ways. Now, imagine being able to fly into a virtual battery park and get not only whatever information, and we can give you block and lot or all of the GIS data that are legal to publish as a matter of course, simply by clicking on one of these things and pushing the right button. URLs can be called from your default browser. Boom. All of those things that David Galernter said people could get to can be got to through this. Now, a feature of it, remember that thing I was talking about, is um, here we see, on the one hand, 
This is the effect on the sight lines of an enormous project uh, from within the park, uh, assuming that certain plans come to fruition about what to plant there and that the trees grow. For every version of every proposal, there is instantaneous and full permanent documentation of the discussion for each iteration of the idea. All of those things are part of the public record permanently. Um, now here, imagine a situation where you can do the pre-design phase, the public contribution to the possibilities and formulation of program requirements before it's too late, with minimal setup cost or operating cost, available, accessible to anyone, anytime, anywhere, an accessible expert system. What that means is that everybody can have access, can see into an expert system which can see out. Uh, and indeed, that access can be the means of development of more expertise, which is customizable and which is a medium for full engagement of all of those faculties. This was supposed to be science fiction. It's not. Remember the Jane's Eye view I promised you? You can get that of anything in what used to be a massing model. Remember, I've got the noise levels available to you, GIS data available to you in due course, the ability to propose changes in there, the ability to discuss those changes. All of that has only the overhead of the time it takes to do, because all of the other investments have already been made, as indeed some have been made by mistake. Here, one of the discussions, this, when talking about Broadway as possibly the, the green way connecting Battery Park and, and Central Park, that's what it looks like to my imaginary Jane Jacobs within a massing model. And I think, is this the Broadway, or will this always be the Broadway? Because there is competition. This is now West Drive. But in terms of the built form, it's actually, we'd have to do way less damage to get that Rambla. Uh, and there's way more potential for setting up frameworks within a rich, mixed community could be not only sustainable, but worth sustaining over generations. Um, and it's not too late. And we can also make those calculations taking into account some things that aren't necessarily quite there yet, but we know are coming. This, I'm out of time, uh, arteries. These arteries got built. They're at the skin. You know this. You take it for granted. Battery Park City actually gets back some of that arterial carrying capacity. Who knows what that make? We have time to think about that because we're not doing it yet. This will also let you do science fiction. Or it will provide an efficient way to visualize a proposal for a public art projection, which will be happening in February and March. A living city is always in beta. Thank you. Anybody got a question? Or was that just perfectly crystal clear? Carl? Yeah. Uh, oh, Vin. Oh, I don't see it anymore. The oh, interesting challenge mind. is um, this technology mm -hmm. should make it possible mm -hmm. for people who are not professionals uh -huh to have opinions about urban form mm -hmm. and to participate in the process of the evolution of cities. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I saw a presentation last week at uh, the TEDx Gotham conference where one of the presenters talked about the fact that architecture is a process now. Uh -huh. And the city is constantly evolving and refining itself. Mm -hmm. So um, how many people here are professionals in the design world? How many people are uh, non-professionals concerned with design? Oh, excellent. Okay, so we're ready for that. Absolutely. That's good. Yeah. Um, so the, the the question is, uh, how can this roll out and be made more generally accessible 
to people like, for example, Yolanda Garcia, who will be here tomorrow, mm -hmm. uh, who's dreamt for years of having an urban design institute in the South Bronx. Okay. Uh, we have the prototypes up and running and stable. And this is an announcement, a description, but it's also an invitation. Anybody who thinks they're ready to try it, we're ready to support. Um, that's all of you. Just let me know. Um, the business of the particular needs and interests of particular, you know, constituencies, so to speak, uh, I mean, the, the business of what visual language makes which sense to whom uh, and how flexible this needs to be as visual rhetoric, fundamentally, uh, to bridge some of those gaps is a, not a technical problem, but it's certainly one that interests us. Uh, what, does, what do you need to run this? Uh, do you need a computer that's less than a decade old and an internet connection? Uh, what do you need to make the models? SketchUp, which is free. Um, and if you can't get it together to download SketchUp, then you can't use this. Uh, but everybody else is inside the fence. Yeah. Oh, I got you going with that thing about the glasses of Sauvignon Blanc, didn't I? Okay, okay. Hey. Mm -hmm. The, uh, we set out to, on the one hand, I mean, the reason we started with Battery Park, because it, you know, it was just a very rich question. Um, and, you know, and Vin and I, we talked about it, and we were interested in this, you know, and having it ready to go. Um, and when the question of Cadman Plaza came to us, because I had models of Polly and had made context for those, that was straightforward. Um, the um, business, and we were also load testing it, you know, how much geometry can you have in there and the thing will still run on our machines or, you know, the server can still handle the demand or local machines because when you talk about the Bronx, it's like what kind of hardware do they have and how do we spec this thing so they can reliably work it and to what level of, you know, graphic load demand. Um, as far as the modeling goes, as soon as we have a reasonable idea of who's going to build how much of the models, and we've done that through, you know, project service learning things and, you know, volunteers recapturing stuff and so on. Um, then uh, you're good to go. Now, are we setting out to build all of New York City? Um, if somebody needs that from us badly enough to help do the work, we'll probably do it. Uh, and if they're not, we probably won't. Uh, but we're not, we're not systematically in the five boroughs business yet. But if you've got a neighborhood you want to do and you'll show up and, you know, not just think of yourself as a customer, but, a, you know, um, then we're ready. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks. Yes? Get to the guys at the workstations. They'll help you. The, uh, we switched servers yesterday, and there may be something that simple. Yes? Let's go beyond the everyday. Before Milan's memorial was completed, it was widely reviled. Mm -hmm. The day that it opened, the park service had to stay open until 10 p.m. because people wouldn't leave. Mm -hmm. Because when they got there, they found not a tombstone. Mm -hmm. What they found was a stone surface that reflected mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. They found a place they could run their fingers over the names. Mm -hmm. They found little cracks in which they could put notes, mm -hmm. in which they could put mm -hmm. flowers. Mm -hmm. They found that within their own body, that mm -hmm. somatically they felt the sight, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that they walked down and mm -hmm. the names went up, mm -hmm. and then they came out of it. Mm -hmm. Architecture is about much more than what we see, or mm -hmm. even here, mm -hmm. it's what we smell, mm -hmm. what we feel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What are the limitations of this in terms of great architecture. Mm -hmm. You're talking to a guy who resents sheetrock. Uh, the, um, we don't pretend to have gotten all the way. Um, we've, we've, we're, we're, the steps we can take 
um, that are available, that are meaningful steps we are taking. Is this the whole story? No. Um, I am the last person on earth who's going to confuse the, the whole body sensation of really actually being in a place with other human beings with a computer screen. Um, but there is quite a bit more that can be done. Um, and when I think of all the levels at which that memorial having actually got realized was miraculous, uh, that was only one of many. Um, you know, that, that proposal didn't make the first cut either. Uh, but um, no, I mean, we still have, we still value the real world. And this is, this is only an instrument in the service of small pieces of what matters about that, what can be contributed to that. But yeah, I can still tell the difference between foam core and brick, I swear. Yeah. Over here. Yeah. Yeah, actually, that, this, I feel like my question is a little bit related. Um, mm -hmm. Just in terms of, I've been thinking in this presentation about um, kind of anthropology and oral histories and mm -hmm. the idea of collective voice versus like an individual voice. Mm -hmm. And it seems like, you know, this puts forward a, a potential for a, a collective visual f future in a way. And I'm mm -hmm. wondering where and how there might be ways in which, um, just like with a, a worry in a way about you know, artistic expression and individual expression, mm -hmm. how it might play into systems like this and, you know, mm -hmm. kind of artistic identity and mm -hmm. the crisis that, you know, a kind of a collective design might, you know, place okay. on that. Okay, so there's two things to know about this. One is that any situation that is architected to uh, a monopoly uh, or a benevolent dictatorship or whatever, um, is is not was we're not going to do the, the and the thing about this is we made we designed this thing to be as deployable by a three person architecture firm as by a city agency as by an artist right and there will always be games that you'll get kicked out of or where they won't let you do your thing but we've made this so you can build your own Betaville as a school teacher, as an artist, as an advocate, um, as the leader of a faction of, of a matter in contention. Um, the visualization has to be there to be the agenda, and how much there you get to make is, I, I mean, I think of it as, I, I actually made uh, a work of art that was actually a projection thing that, for, that projected onto people's chests when they came into rooms having been in a hurry. It was just a slow breathing thing, and there was a whole thing about it. By the time you figured out what it was doing, you'd settled back into your body. And it was called the agency inducer, and what it was supposed to do was perfectly balance freedom and responsibility. And it worked perfectly every time because that job was always already done. And this thing is engineered for that. So, yeah. If somebody, somebody makes a Betaville, they can kick you out of it, or they can not let you do what you want. You can make your own, and if people show up, that's how much power you have, and that's how much responsibility you got. And because it can run on not just my fancy pants laptop, because I got a you know, bitch and company Camaro, because uh, I run a digital media thing, it'll run on some not terribly fancy hardware. Uh, yeah. One more question. Okay. Um, this may yeah. be a rhetorical question, but I'm imagining uses for this. Mm -hmm. Do you see this as the kind of thing, say, a building, a project, or whatever is proposed for an area of the city? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we want the people, the community, people mm -hmm. in the neighborhood and the community mm -hmm. involved in understanding it, mm -hmm. but maybe in also tweaking it. Exactly. Is this something that people could sort of stand around and say, well, what if you did this and what if you did that? And could be feedback to the proposers, the developers, yeah. the designers? Yeah, so there's it? two modes of that. One is people can comment on it and give you feedback and then you can alter the model. The other is, because sometimes people have comments that you don't quite get what they're after and you start making models and, oh, that's not what I mean, no, that's not what I mean. They can make an alternate model. And as the process can converge on consensus from visualizations. Because people can have a common understanding of a model a lot faster and a lot more reliably than they can have a common understanding of a description of the ultimate form. You could also use it, incidentally, because this was a thing we talked about for Bremen, 
which is a slightly different situation where they have residential streets that stop at a chain link fence and there's you know, grass on the other side and they haven't figured out what to do. If somebody could propose a muse, it's like, I could do a townhouse's worth. Anybody else out there? Oh, me too. Oh, I want to put in a metal shop. Um, well, how much noise is that going to make? Well, we'll man, you know, so on and so forth. And you make a little, you know, a village, and that thing in Betaville can act as an RFP for a small developer and a challenge to the city to explain why that shouldn't be legal, why it should have to wait for a billion dollar mega project that's going to be a disaster. Thank you. Carl, I want to thank you so, so much. Carl has been such a tremendous partner. There are as many people out there with your students as there are in here, so those guys must be pretty good that are out there. Thank you very much, and I guess that Betaville does continue. Um, everyone is invited to tonight's Masterworks Awards. Because we are running late and it was so worth it, um, you're going to miss my fabulous synopsis of the day. Um, sorry about that. It really was pretty good, actually. But um, uh, we <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, but I'll, we'll try to hit a little bit of it tomorrow. We have a really dynamic Friday. Um, uh, beginning with uh, Judith Roden, uh, president of the Rockefeller Foundation, and Kate Levin um, from DCA, and uh, fantastic uh, panels and discussions on the Garment District and Moynihan Station. Um, and um, as I had said earlier this morning, I guess our registration went up. We had about we had 580 registrants for 400 seats. It's not a destination conference. People will come and go. I noticed at various times of the day we had as many people in the Sustainability Cafe and in Betaville as we've had here. There have been monitors. It seems to be working. Um, it, is a gr it has been a great first day and the first ever annual summit, um, uh, MAS Summit for Livability in New York City. So I want to thank you all so much uh, for staying. I want to again thank Carl. And just before we wrap, I want to thank the Rockefeller Foundation, the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, the Winston Foundation, Con Edison, Helleba, American Express, Tishman Spire, the William and Mary Grieve Foundation, the Tiffany and Company Foundation, the Educational Foundation of America, and our media sponsor, the New York Times. The livability survey this morning uh, was uh, such a hit that Eddie Torres and I must have done, I don't know, 15 interviews in something like an hour and a half. And then as other parts of the summit uh, started to come out, like the demographics work and more and some of the social media started to hit, we got more and more calls from people not here wanting to know what was going on here. I heard the MAS server crashed from people trying to get to the survey results. So all good. It's all good. Please stay for Masterworks. There is plenty of Chardonnay and some fancy handouts, uh, hors d'oeuvres. And 9 o'clock tomorrow morning, please, please join us. Thank you so much.